Thank you for your kind introduction, Thomas. I would like to express my gratitude to Kalanish for inviting me to speak at Asia Steel Markets 2022. It is a privilege for me to attend this conference with so many eminent speakers from our industry. I look forward to gaining new perspectives as they also share their perceptions. Uh, today, I would like to start with a global overview. Then I talk about recent developments in East Asia, China, Korea, and Japan. Then I will touch upon our company, JV Steel. I hope that adding a global perspective will be helpful in understanding the particular position of the steel industry in East Asia. As we have watched the pandemic evolve, we all expected that end will eventually come and stable post-pandemic recovery would follow globally. However, the pandemic is ongoing and any recovery is being threatened also by high inflation pressure with supply constraints and the disruption and uncertainty created by war in Ukraine and unforeseen geopolitical development. This month, I traveled to London to attend the World Steel Association meetings. This was my first international trip since the outbreak of the pandemic. Here in Japan, we still wear masks and we still have testing and quarantine requirements for those entering Japan. But in the UK, no additional formality were required at the time of arrival and the people are not wearing masks either inside or outside. The only people I could see wearing masks were Asians, perhaps like me, visiting the UK from abroad. So some countries are opening up their borders and lives in those places are returning to what they were before the pandemic. Other countries are keeping restrictions in place. Number of new cases in China does not look so bad on the chart on the left. Because of the scale of the chart and China's huge population. However, because of their zero corona policy, strict lockdowns in large cities are affecting their economies. Looking at manufacturing, supply chain constraints are leading to supply delays and higher materials prices. Car production was severely undermined by a semiconductor shortage. Inflationary pressure is mounting in both developed and developing economies. The war in Ukraine is having far reaching consequences. Disruption of trade with Russia and Ukraine, interruption of trade, established supply chains, a refugee crisis. Over one tenth of Ukraine's population has left the country geopolitical alliances are being tested and in some cases being reconfigured. When I was in Europe this month, I found Ukraine flags were being flown at private and at public buildings. Ironically, it appears Russian aggression has accelerated EU confusion. Now the peoples there see Ukraine as eu Ukraine. Sanctions and market responses are having spillover effects in Europe and beyond. Disruption to supply of key commodities and raw materials are pushing the prices for them higher. I have been involved in business development for a significant part of my career. When we develop growth strategy, we talk about Greenfield, which is to build a new steel plant, and Brownfield which is to acquire or expand an existing steel plant. But I never imagined that we would be using other phrase, battlefield, when referring to a steel facility. Some steel works in Ukraine are under attack, literally becoming battlefields. I do not understand exactly the full historical and cultural complexity of the region but I sincerely hope that some resolution can be found so that aggression can be brought to an end 
as quickly as possible. Let's see how the energy self-sufficiency of each country is affecting its GDP growth. IMF adjusted downward the economic forecast of countries depending on their reliance on imported energy. This chart is about the share of the commodity exports of Russia and Ukraine in world exports. The chart on the right shows the Russian and Ukrainian steel export accounts for 10% of the global trade, which is a substantial amount. In 2021, Russia exported 30 million tons of steel and Ukraine 60 million tons. Europe is their largest export destination. Because of the sanctions against Russia and falling steel production in Ukraine, the traditional importers of Russian and Ukraine steel products are looking for alternative sources. The result is, as you see, rising steel prices. Iron ore and scrap prices are also on the rise. This slide shows the IMFs, the forecast for GDP growth, which came out last week. The red dots show the forecast announced in January this year. IMF adjusted its forecast downward in most countries, resulting in a decrease of the world growth from 4.4% to 3.6%. Most affected are Ukraine and Russia. EU and other countries are also affected, with the exception of oil-producing regions. Rising commodities and raw materials prices caused by the war in Ukraine may add inflationary pressure and attempts by various countries to contain and limit this pressure may lead to slowing economies. So what about steel demand? In 2021, Recovery from the initial pandemic shock turned out to be stronger than expected in many regions. Despite continuing supply chain issues and subsequent waves of COVID infection. However, a deceleration in China, which was sharper than anyone anticipated, led to lower global steel demand growth in 2021. For 2022 and 23, Outlook is highly uncertain because of the war in Ukraine and rising inflation. Magnitude and breadth of the war impact will vary across regions, depending on the amount of direct trade with and exposure to Russia and Ukraine. The impact will be felt globally in terms of higher energy and commodity prices and continued supply chain disruptions. According to World Steel, Global steel demand is focused to increase marginally 0.4% to 1.84 billion tons. This slide compares steel use in 2021, 22, and 23 against 2019, the pre-COVID year. Emerging economies such as Turkey, Brazil, India, and China, and in developed economies like Germany, South Korea and the US. Steel use has a little return to the 2019 level or will do so within this year. Japan is on its way to the 2019 level and Ukraine and Russia expects a huge decrease. So let us talk about developments in East Asia. Uh, China's GDP rate ex ex increased slightly in the first quarter of this year but the March data suggests a slowdown. Lockdowns in large cities and restrictions in line with the zero corona policy are weighing on China's industrial activities. Fixed asset investment decreased steadily in Q1 because of strong infrastructure investment, but real estate remains sluggish. Retail sales and passenger traffic are slowing down again export continues to pass them, uh, steel use will remain flat in 2022. The Chinese government said it continues to reduce crude steel production this year. Regulations on steel capacity replacement will be maintained 
and no tax rebates for steel exports remain unchanged. Next, South Korea. South Korea GDP increased with the pandemic situation easing and export drawing. Auto production is growing modestly, but not so strongly because of the semiconductor shortage. The construction sector will be supported by public civil engineering projects and residential construction recovery. New orders for shipbuilding and deliveries are recovering also. Steel demand in South Korea is expected to increase 1.2% to 56 million tons in 2022. Let's turn to developments in Japan. Steel demand is recovering gradually with increasing export investment and consumption. GDP's forecast increased 2.4% in 2022 uh, which is down from the earlier forecast of 3.0%. Business sentiment in the service sector is gradually recovering, but is still slower than the manufacturing sector. About steel using sectors, a recovery of auto production is slower than expected due to the shortage of semiconductors. Machinery is also back. Housing and non-residential construction starts are recovering. Public civil construction has been affected negatively, partly due to the rising construction costs. The recovery in Japan's steel demand will be moderate, and Japan's steel demand is forecast to increase 1.2% to 58 million tons in 2022. About JP Steel, JP Steel is a part of JP Holdings, and JP Steel has the sister companies, JP Engineering, JP Shoji, which is a trading arm of JP Group, and shipbuilding company, Japan Marine United. In terms of the contribution to the revenue, steel business, which is JP Steel, is the largest among the all operating companies. Uh, the map on the right shows the where we have uh, production facilities and centers. JF Steel produced 27 million tons of crude steel. Over 80% of its products are sheets and the plates. The rest are long products, tubular goods, and semi-finished products. So these are the products and JF Steel can offer. I'm not going to read one by one. Uh, JF intends to take twofold initiatives, measures to ensure environmental and social sustainability, and the measures to ensure economic sustainability. Uh, regarding the first part related to ESG, JF Group has developed environmental vision for 2050 with an objective of realizing carbon neutrality by 2050. I'll provide more details with the following slides. The second pillar is to solve issues impacting society. The third one to ensure and enhance corporate governance. Uh, this is a rather a busy chart. I would like to highlight the two bullet points above. JFE is taking a multiple track approach to develop innovative technologies focusing on carbon recycling blast furnace and carbon capture and utilization, CCU. Hydrogen iron making, maximizing the utilization of leading electric arc furnace technology. This slide summarizes what JF intends to achieve with the carbon recycled blast furnace and CCU. We are stepping up our endeavors to reduce CO2 emissions by maximizing carbon recycling into blast furnaces, reducing basic chemicals, producing basic chemicals such as methanol, using CO2 as a resource. One of the products from CCU is plastics. Plastics are collected, reprocessed, and fed into blast furnaces as a resource. These cycles, we hope, will contribute to the circular economy. 
For the economic sustainability, JFE intends to transform its steel segment into a much thinner, robust business structure by shifting focus from quantity to quality, strengthening global strategies, using digital technology to reinvigorate production bases and accelerating innovation for carbon neutrality. Regarding our global growth strategy, this diagram illustrates a network of global alliances. We are stepping up our efforts to promote and strengthen our global growth strategies further by providing solutions based on our knowledge, skills, and data to our own businesses and to our partners. By doing so, we expect to expand our overseas businesses' contributions to our bottom line. Our strategy is we are committed to grow with our customers globally. Uh, thank you for your attention and the opportunity to share my views. I look forward to meeting you all again, hopefully in person, at the next conference.